Good morning and welcome to worship on today, March 7th. I hope that you're feeling blessed. I hope that you're feeling the presence of God with you as we gather together for this time of worship. A couple announcements before we begin our worship today. As the Lenten season continues, um, we, I want to make sure that everyone's aware that you are welcome to join us on Monday nights at 6 o'clock for our prayer time right here in the sanctuary. Uh, I also hope that you know that you are invited to participate either in person or online for our Matthew 25 Bible study that's currently progressing. If you're feeling like, oh, I can't attend because I've missed the first one, the first two, um, the Bible study doesn't work like that. We're going after different sections of Matthew 25 and kind of building our understanding, but at the same time, you can walk in and you would be perfectly fine and understand what it is that we're talking about that week. So you can either follow us on our YouTube page or you can uh, join us in person seven o'clock on Monday nights. Also, as we progress through Lent, we are coming up on Holy Week and this Holy Week is going to look a little bit different. This year, we are going to put a lot of effort into Monday Thursday and sharing in that Passover meal with one another. Although we aren't going to be kosher by any means, um, we are going to have soup that is available that we are hoping to give out to people in the community. So you or anyone else can come by and pick up free soup um, and join us as best we can in sharing that meal and that time together. The next thing is, is I wanted to make sure that there were plenty of opportunities for us to worship together on Easter morning. So soon you're going to be seeing registration information coming out so that you can register for one of three possibilities for Easter morning. There will either be Easter morning worship in the park, which is a small sunrise service where we will pray and greet the coming of our Lord together. And we will have two worship services that will be right here in the sanctuary. One will be at 930 and the other we're expecting, it might change a little bit, but we're expecting to be around 11 so that we can finish up the early service, wipe services down, and then invite new people in. So you should receive information about how to register for those services ahead of time to make sure that we stay around 50 people or less in the sanctuary and make sure that we're safe and properly socially distanced, but also welcoming the rising of the coming Lord. So I hope that you can join us for some or all of those opportunities, and I hope that you know that today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship the Lord.
Will you join me in the call to worship? We come this day, precious God, as people in need of your steadfast love. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. We gather this day, water-changing God, as people looking for signs. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. We worship this day, gifting God. As people who confess Jesus as our Lord, with you is the fountain of life. In you is the light that we see light. Our first hymn this week is hymn number 485, To God Be the Glory. We come now to a time of confession, a time of lifting our hearts before the Lord, of sharing the burdens and the personal choices that hold us back from being able to experience and strengthen our relationship with God. So I invite you to pray with me this prayer of confession. Jesus, cleanser of temples and souls, at this midpoint in the Lenten journey, Look deep within our hearts and our lives and clear away all that holds us back. May our minds, spirits, and bodies be a temple that is open to your presence. And may our words and actions be transparent to your love and truth. We pray that this church community will be purified in its life and mission so that all that we do in and from here may reveal your gospel to others. In a moment of silence, we sent before you and name those things for which we seek your cleansing and healing so that we may be more faithful disciples. Hear now these words of assurance. Friends of Jesus, we are made clean by the words he has spoken to us. There is room in our lives and in our community for the Holy One to dwell. Thanks be to God. Amen. How's it going, kids? I invite you to join me by getting in a place where you can see or you can hear me um, and join in with me in this children's time 
a focus time just for you guys. I want to uh, share with you a little bit about what we're talking about today in the scripture passage, because this scripture passage is something that is challenging, is hard to understand, but is also one of those things that we all struggle with. And it's important to remember that God is speaking to us today and every day. The point of the scripture passage is a story about how Jesus comes into his temple, the temple that is built for his father in heaven, built for God, who we pray to and we love. And it is filled, filled with things that are meant to build walls between God and his people. And Jesus sees this, and he knows that each and every one of these things make it harder for people to get close to God. And he gets angry about it, and he starts clearing the temple, clearing the path, making it so that all that stuff is brushed away. Making the way clear. Making the way clear so that it's easier for us to see and get closer to God. Now, the reason why I said that this is something that we all struggle with is because in our everyday lives, we tend to fill things up as best we can so that we're not bored, so that we're not sitting around with nothing to do. But sometimes when we work so hard to do that, we fill it up with stuff that doesn't really matter. And that make it harder for us to know that God loves us. And Lent, the time that we're in, is an important time to look at our lives and make sure that we're doing the things that we know are important. Helping other people, praying to God, showing God's love to everybody who we meet, and making sure that we're not just full of all the other stuff and don't have time for the really important things. So always remember, no matter how busy you are, no matter what's going on in your life, if you don't have time to really think about how God loves you, think about how God loves the other people in your school and in your family and whoever you meet, then it's important that we start pulling back a little bit, taking things out. Because if we don't leave time for God, if we don't have time, to really focus on what God is doing in our lives? Well, what's the point of all the other stuff? If you don't know that God loves you, and you never take the time to think about and pray and enjoy that fact, it makes everything else so much harder. So always look around and take the time to see God's love. Now, there's a song that I think of when I was putting together that message, and I wanted to share it with you. It's not an easy song, but I was hoping that if we sang it together, we might understand it at the end. It's called Sweet, Sweet Spirit, and it has a very short verse, which I want you to listen close to, and then it has a chorus, which I'm going to sing through twice so that we have a chance to hear it, understand it, So pay close attention to the words, and if at any point you want to sing with me, just join right in. Okay? Okay. Let's give it a try. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There's a sweet expression on each face, and I know that it's the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, Stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. 
Without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. One more time on the part that I just sang. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. I hope that you heard the words, and I hope that they meant to you what they mean to me, which is there's something beautiful about focusing in on God and remembering how much God loves you. Peace be with you all, and I'll talk to you again soon. Peace. Our scripture passage today comes to us from the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you the authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember he had said this, and they believed both scriptures and what Jesus had said. So the passage today is a challenging one. Because it's talking about Jesus doing something that we don't really have a place for in Scripture. We don't really have a place for in our gospel stories. Or if you walk around any church, I'm sure you'll see pictures of Jesus where he seems so serene. So, well, nice. And... We have the shepherding, the, the healing, the, um, the advice giving, the preaching Jesus in our heads. But Jesus in this particular passage shows great passion. Passion for what he knows to be true, for what he believes in, and for probably the one thing that makes God angry in all of scripture the most, which is separating people from God. And there's a lot of context to this story. Story about how these temple courts that were outside of the temple temple, where sacrifices were done, where prayers and the reading of the Torah happened, this was a large area, a marketplace, a Lots of people, lots of merchants, lots of all sorts of businesses had gathered around this area. And they did it because not only was the temple kind of the center of Jerusalem and where people could go and gather for things, but because there was an instant market built into the structure of the temple. If you, you were required to go to the temple yearly, and do a sacrifice to the Lord to pay for and exalt um, the sins which you had committed during the year. So you would go, 
and you needed to come with a proper sacrifice so that you could be made right with God. A lot of people didn't know what the proper sacrifice would be. They had to be told what it was going to be. And then they would have to purchase the sacrifice. So that's obviously a thing because of necessity that would create merchants, that would create all sorts of things. You would have Jews coming from different nations, so they would have different money that wouldn't be acceptable there. So they would need to exchange that money and then buy something. And it ended up becoming a huge, arduous process. And there were many other merchants. There were banks. The temple bank that gave loans to people was there. All of that business, all of that commerce was located in that holy place. But over time, things developed so that it wasn't built out of convenience. It wasn't built out of necessity. It was built to turn a profit. All businesses want to make money. And slowly over time, a business can lose focus on what it is that they were intentionally doing. And as demand rises, wouldn't you know it, so do prices. So Jesus comes in and the scene that he sees in front of him for a normal person walking into the market is you're going to have to sacrifice two doves. Okay, well, I'm going to go over to the foreign merchant to trade in some of my foreign money to get money that I can use here. Well, there's a fee on that, a pretty exorbitant fee. And then you take that money over to the doves and you know what? They don't cost the amount of money that you would suspect or that seems fair for two doves to cost, but you have to have these doves. Otherwise you're not going to be able to make your sacrifice. So you pay it. So there's a little bit of overhead on that. And then you take it to be sacrificed and you want to do that so that your business at home, so that you're right with God, there's a fee from the temple in order to do the sacrifice. So you've paid overhead on what you should be doing for one task three times. And people couldn't afford it. People were being pushed away from it. People were being held away from a relationship with God despite their intention, despite their best efforts, because others were trying to make money off of that need. There's no doubt about it. Jesus was angry about this. Jesus saw what was happening in those temple courts. And I think rage might best describe the feeling that Jesus felt. As it says in the latter half of the passage, his disciples remembered the prophecy from Scripture which said, passion for God's house will consume me. That's not annoyance. That's not, ah, I see what you're doing, but you really need to change it around. That's anger. We have images in our heads of Jesus flipping tables. It says here in this passage that Jesus fashioned a whip out of cords and drove people and animals from the courtyard. Rage at someone taking someone's desire to be close to God and putting barriers, extra barriers, between them and God. You have to do this, this, and this in order to make it to God. Jesus can't handle this. And he drives them away. A lot of times people might ask the question, what happened between Palm Sunday when Jesus is entering the city on a donkey and there are crowds going wild. People are laying their coats and palm branches in the street. People are screaming Hosanna. People seem to recognize that Jesus is amazing and incredible. <clears throat> Jesus is the Messiah. What happened between that and Good Friday? Where you have crowds cheering for his death. The simple answer to that question is the temple. That is what happened. 
That is the difference. That is what soured Jesus to the crowds. The temple is a holy place. The temple is a place of authority. The temple is the temple. And you cause this kind of ruckus in the temple, there are going to be ramifications for that. This is the practical reason on why Jesus was killed. This is what the authorities pointed to and said, this guy's a troublemaker, a stirrer up of things, a revolutionary. We can't have this walking around our town. And as much as we'd hate to admit it, this kind of attitude, this kind of um, seeing what's going on in the world is the exact same way that it is today. That kind of fighting against an oppressive system that pushes people down and shoves them and grinds them down so that they can't possibly know that they're loved, that they're children of God. When we mess with a system like that, there are ramifications, and people get very angry. The thing that I want us to take away from this, though, today, in this Lenten season, is the concept of removing those barriers between yourself and God, where we don't help systems of oppression like that, where we remove the things in our own hearts that we build up in ourselves in order to keep us away from God's grace and God's mercy. I can't come to church on Sundays because I have to work. I can't come to the Bible study because I'm too tired. I can't go and do this service project because I don't have time for it right now. Maybe I will later. These systems are systems from society, but also systems that we create ourselves. And Lent is a perfect time of seeing those systems, identifying those barriers, and trying to remove them from our lives. Jesus saw them as a huge problem and something that needed to be addressed in non-negotiable terms. And those are systems that we can see in society around us today and in our own hearts that need to be worked on, need to be pushed out, need to be removed so that our path to God is clear. Jesus was killed for it. It's not easy. Doing that kind of change in your own personal life, it's not easy. But that's why we come together as the church, as the body of Christ, so that we can, in love, reach out, identify these kind of obstacles, and seek to remove them. Not at the detriment of others. We're not gearing up to fashion our own whips and go out and destroy things. But we are trying to remove obstacles. Make it so that the path is clear for ourselves and for other people to see that God is their Father in heaven and they have access to that love. So I challenge you on this day in Lent to look at yourself and ask yourself, are there systems that I'm a part of that have pushed people out, that have ground people down, that have made them believe that they are not worthy of love? And are there barriers in my own heart that I have established because of my job, my family, the way that I've organized my life, <coughs> excuse me, that have made it so that I don't have a clear path. Now is the time. Now is the time to remove those barriers and to seek God as God calls each and every one of us out of love and hope for the relationship that can be. Peace be with you, and amen. We come now to a time of prayer, a time of lifting our hearts before God and sharing the concerns that we have, but also the joys of experiencing God's holy love together. So will you pray with me? Let us now pray to the Father of light, 
that we may truly become the salt and light of the world. Let us say, Lord, let your light shine in us. That there be more love on earth, Lord. We ask you to dispose people to more understanding and friendlier to one another and to share more readily with those in need. So we pray, Lord, let your light shine in us. That there may be greater justice on earth. Dispose governments and public officials to make room in their priorities and budgets for the socially deprived, those out of jobs. Lord, we pray. Lord, let your light shine in us. That there may be more peace on earth. Dispose all nations to put an end to words of hatred and threats of revenge, we pray. Lord, let your light shine in us. That there may be more joy on earth. Dispose all those who follow your Son to show sympathy and affection to one another, to be faithful in our friendships and concerned about our communities. We pray, Lord, let your light shine in us. That there may be more faith on earth. Dispose all your sons and daughters to live as children of light before you and in the sight of people. We pray, Lord, let your light shine in us. Lord God, we pray that your light may shine on all the earth, however limited we are. Let our words and actions reflect the light of your love. In the name of Jesus the Lord, amen. Our closing hymn this week is hymn number 538, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lay his hands upon you. And may you go out into the world knowing that you can indeed do miracles, that you can indeed remove those barriers between yourself and others to God. Peace be with you. Amen. <laughs>